project is due five classes from now, Thursday next week. It is much, much sooner than you anticipate. I expect that you'll have to spend approximately 20 hours on the course project. So that's, uh, that's typical for most projects. And the reason is the scope of the work we find between one or two or three of your other projects will be in order of that amount of time to write up and do the work. Now, what I've done is I recognize that it's so close is that there is no tutorial with new questions in the tutorial series. The tutorial time today, or the first version of the tutorial time tomorrow in the next room, is a time where you go and put the TA and get your questions answered. Just a second, everyone, let's pay attention here. It is basically an opportunity for you to speak with the TA and have office hours without arranging office hours. Next week will be the same as well. So today's tutorial, there were about 10 people that showed up out of 40. That's your, your choice, right? I don't expect it to be at the tutorial, but recognize that this is a time for you to see me, and recognize that if you're trying to see me outside of class, it's almost impossible because my schedule is pretty much for eight hours a day for full work that we need to and teach. So those two hours today and the two hours next week are really pretty much some of the only hours available. I am available some of the other times, but it's much, much harder to coordinate between your classes and my people. So let's just take a look at what you should be doing with that course project. At least this week you should be going with a fine step.
main reason is most reactors have heat effects. Reactions that typically place, take place in liquid phase will have some amount of heat effect, but it's so negligible that it's the entire system. Gas phase reactions definitely heat effects are pretty So we have this situation where we, most of our reactions are exothermic or endothermic. We also have the issue that if the reaction is endothermic or exothermic, we need to either supply heat or remove heat from the system. How does that impact the system and, and where does it impact it? Well, it impacts in two places. One is the equilibrium constant, the second place is the rate constant. So let's take a look at both of those and we'll consider again this one. A plus B with K1 in the forward, K1 in the reverse, and let's do the backward direction, going to C plus D. And we derived before that the equilibrium constant, so we call this Kc, equilibrium, and I've used this notation of curly braces, which refers to the concentration at equilibrium of C and D in the numerator, A and B in the denominator. And we also know that that's defined as K1 in the forward direction, K1 over K1 in the reverse direction. So this definition for equilibrium constants has two parts. One is the ratio of concentrations, the other part is the ratio of rate constants. And in an earlier class, around about the fourth week of this term, we showed that that equilibrium constant is a function of temperature. And we derived something along the lines of Kc at equilibrium Given the room's temperature, we can find that equilibrium constant at any other temperature through this expression over here. So it's an exponential equation and it's related to the heat of reaction 1 over T ref minus T. And so those are the rate, rate constants you see in the course project are given to you in that form. You've got a reference rate equilibrium constant. There's a heat of reaction at some equilibrium, uh, at some reference temperature. And then we, re we subtract off 1 over t rev minus 1 over t. And we also showed in the prior class that, that we had to draw that relationship. As a function of temperature, we would find that for exothermic reactions, that Kc value will absorb. And for endothermic reactions, it goes up. So if we just make some notes here, at high temperature, Kc drops off. And that actually drives the reaction back into the reverse direction, or indicates to us that we're not going to form as much product as we hope. So at high temperature, the equilibrium constant drops off for exothermic reactions. So we call an exothermic reaction has delta HR that's negative. So this term here in the exponential is what's causing the decrease for us. So delta HR being negative, R is a positive quantity. 1 over T ref minus 1 over T, that will be a positive quantity causing this exponential to drop off gradually. So that's what we observe for exothermic reactions. It's actually a really great thing that it does that because it prevents exothermic reactions from running away. If we take a look at our chemistry here, this is telling me that at high temperatures, I've got a small equilibrium constant for exothermic reactions. A small equilibrium constant means I've got low amount of products forming. So I've got the fact that I've got low amounts of products forming means I've got a high amount of reactants left behind. That's a good thing because delta HR is releasing heat. Delta HR is 
joules per mole of A reacted. So it prevents the reaction from running away. Okay, not in all cases, but in many cases it prevents the reaction from running away and causing safety issues for us. So it's actually kind of a good thing that this happens. We have a, a counter issue though happening. When we're going to high temperatures, sure my equilibrium constant drops off, but my rate constant goes up. So let's just recap how that happens again. Expressed as K1 as a function at the reference temperature, which we, which we know. And it has a similar equation structure with the activation energy E over R multiplied by 1 over T ref minus T. And so K1 will increase the high temperatures. that always take place. For exothermic reactions, let's consider only exothermic. The same happens for endothermic, just the, in reverse. So for exothermic reactions, if I go to higher temperatures, K1, lowercase k, my rate, my, uh, rate constant, increases. So the rate of the forward reaction goes up, driving more raw materials, A and B, over to products. But it's an exothermic reaction. So as I'm driving from raw materials to products, I'm releasing heat. As I'm releasing heat, the temperature goes up, but then my rate constant gets forced down, driving me in the reverse direction back to products again. Okay? So it prevents things from getting out of hand. It also means that when we design our reactors, there's very much a trade-off between temperature where we choose to operate. We operate too low, we will never actually get my raw materials converted over to products. Operate too high, I'm going to get such fast reactions that I very quickly and very rapidly approach equilibrium, but at a low equilibrium, so I never actually get products forming. So very much a middle ground that we need to strike, and it's exactly what the project asks me to do, is to find that optimum temperature that will lead to a greater yield. So, the reasoning is quite easy to explain just from these two fairly basic concepts which we're comfortable with from early chemistry courses. Now let's apply them in this course and design our reactors. So let's take a look at where we're heading with this section with a very trivial example that will underscore how we're going to structure our, our problem. So this simple example will show where we're heading for both our course projects and for more complicated reactor designs. Up at T over 
that that T mod over T term would be isothermal assumption. We're now going to say we're taking that out. We're going to assume that the temperature does in fact vary in my reactor. So at the entrance, if I had to plot temperature, I may start at some T naught and it will go up. So here's T naught and it will increase as I go through the reactor to some final temperature T. So temperature changes along the reactor length. So we're taking that, that previous assumption we made and we're now relaxing. What I will do just for this initial illustration is we'll assume isobaric behavior. So bring that assumption back in a minute. So that's my expression for CA. The reason why I need CA is because if I look back at my design equation for a plug flow reactor, we had dx by dv, the rate of change of conversion along the reactor's length, is given by minus Ra over Fa0. Or you could write it as minus Ra is equal to CA0 for the Q0, the entry for the So these were earlier design equations. Notice this part of the course is trying to bring everything from all the five, six, five chapters is going to rapidly come together over the next four final classes. Really bringing everything that's working together to answer major reactor design problems. So we derived this earlier for a PFR. So if I sum in what I know here, yeah, I know the rate expression minus RA is KCA. I know that CA then is given in terms of conversion and now the new part is also a function of temperature. So that's new for us. Let's substitute that in there. And if you do that, you can show that you get KACA naught, one minus conversion over Q naught, one plus epsilon x. And then we also have this term out here, T naught over T. So just keep it really separate. Initial condition, we put one ODE, and initial condition is x at v equals zero. It's assumed to be zero, we've got no conversion at the inlet. But we also have a new equation now. This guy up here. That my rate constant Ka, Previously, I assumed that to be constant, my rate constant, isn't constant anymore now. Ka, my rate constant, is Ka at some reference temperature, usually 25 degrees C. I have my activation energy, the gas constant R, the reference temperature, 1 over T. Okay, so, I can, in fact, now substitute this Ka equation into this term over here. So recognize that that Ka now isn't constant anymore. It is a function of temperature. We should be substituting that term in over there. So more correctly, I should write this out here as Okay. And here's my problem. I don't know the temperature. I know it's changing. This ODE here is only in terms of conversion over volume. So what we need here to solve this problem is one of two things. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. 
So to, to resolve this issue so we can actually integrate this in, in Polymath or MATLAB, we need one of two things. So either we require temperature as a function of conversion. So I need an explicit algebraic equation that gives me that. Or I need temperature as a function of volume. And this is via a dt by dv or dv. So I have two options here. we see the first one next class, the, the second option you will definitely use in your course project, where our temperature is changing along the reactive profile. So that's why this red line is that I drew down here initially. We have an equation that tells me what T is as I go from the beginning to the end of my reactor. So it's ODE, ET by DV. Um, is it an algebraic equation for the So we're, yeah, we can derive in, under certain conditions, adiabatic reactions particularly, so we'll look at that next class. Under adiabatic reactions, reactors, this reduces down to a regular algebraic equation. In general though, we'll just derive an ODE and that's polymath and that's that to be able to build both, both profiles. So we'll get a profile for conversion and we'll get a profile for temperature. Uh, I have a question. Uh, are you using formulas to actually generate a function of temperature volume, or are you running the reactor and then just measuring the temperature a lot the reactor and then just plotting on it? Ideally, we would, but the whole purpose of reactor design is that we don't build the reactor. We design the reactor first and then predict what these profiles are, then build it, and we hope that our predictions succeed. So we're going to, that's exactly what we're going to derive next. We're going to derive those either option. So we'll see that under very simplified assumptions, we get an algebraic equations. The more general case we're going to derive, we'll get the algorithm we're creating. So let's take a look at that derivation. This is where the long, boring thermodynamics and chemistry begin. Hopefully it's not too boring. But if you do look this up in the textbook, it's pretty overwhelming in terms of the number of pages and pages of derivation. So let's, I've simplified it somewhat and tried to find an easy way to, to understand it, but there is still some technical detail we must get through. So let's take a look back at that thermo, where we derive this generic system. Okay, so I'll write in brackets that that system, for our instances, will simply just be a reactor. And in thermo, you had expressions such as Q dot, which is the amount of heat added into the system, so say rate of heat added. This is in volts per second to the system. And the system also did some work on the environment. So the system had some work, W dot, so rate of work on the environment. And that's also in joules per second. Joules per second. terms that are necessary for this derivation is the energy flow into and out of the system. So this first term coming in, we've got some flow F0 in, and we've got a flow F, I'll just call it Fx. So the flow will use a slightly different notation. But you'll see why I changed it a little bit up now. So those are my four 
four features that I'm going to consider on that system. And for most, for most cases, that system's boundary corresponds exactly to the reactor's boundary. So it's, it's a good approximation just to consider this the reactor. Now, you'll recall some equations of the form the energy accumulation in the system as a function of time is then the rate at which you add work to the system minus the rate at which the work on the environment is done. And then we've got the summation here for I equals 1 to N. This is the notation we introduced last class. I'll recap it in a minute. So the energy coming into the system from an IR species multiplied by the flow out minus again for the ice species up to n energy at the exit for the ice species times the flow of i at the exit. So we can best summarize this term here as energy in by flow Something happens in the system, those various I components, so I is my species, and there are N of them. Those N species will react with each other, and the energy leaving out by flow will be quite different from the energy coming in. And particularly if reactions take place and heat is released, or heat is create, uh, released, or heat is consumed, if in, in an endothermic case, the energy flow in will be very different from the energy flowing out. Okay, so this is, this is uh, thermodynamics from your 2D and 2F course. So if I just define here, Q and W are measured in joules per second. Let's just take a look at the derivation then for Fi and Ei. Fi would be the flow, the molar flow, so moles of I, of the I species per unit time. And Ei, I'll just leave here as generic as the energy of I. So that's measured in joules per mole. Simplify a little bit from what Vogler has. There's quite a, there's a few steps in between here. But essentially, Vogler goes back to thermodynamics and shows how that energy is related to the enthalpy. And what you can derive then just make some notes here that W dot is equal to the shaft work. plus flow And if you look at, back at the thermal derivation info, where you move some terms around from this W term, W dot, into this energy term, and you then get enthalpy, enthalpy terms, which are easier for us to work with. I'll leave the derivation for you to read. It's a half a page or so, but I don't think it helps us understand anything more than we need to. So I'll simply write here that moving terms around, we then get the more generic balance that we'll actually prefer to work with. And that's the rate of change of energy in the system with time, so dE by dt is then equal to Q dot, so the same term as before. But this time, I'm, I'm only taking shaft work into account WS. And then we now re-express everything in terms of enthalpy. So the sum from I equals 1 to N of Fi0, so flow in of the I species multiplied by its enthalpy H. 
leaving at the exit, FI exit, occupied by the end of the period HR. So this is the generic equation where we're going to start from. This is the equation that's eventually going to relate temperature over to conversion for us, and we're going to land up with another one. Well, I in fact simplify this quite substantially because that is so general, many, ter many of those terms get set to zero for most practical systems of interest. So let's take a look at that next. So add here for most systems we deal with, add steady state. We can set that derivative with times. We set that to zero. So there's no energy accumulated in the system. Also make a note here that if adiabatic, that implies an adiabatic system implies there's no heat exchange, so Q dot is equal to zero. So sometimes that's a realistic assumption. If the reactor is very well insulated, there's no heat exchanged with the environment, so across the boundary of my system, I've got no heat being added or removed. All the energy remains within the system. That's Q dot is equal to zero. So that gives us a nice simplification. The course project is not a diabetic. The course project, the reactor, is taking place in a shell and tube heat exchanger, and you're remo removing heat from the system. So we cannot make this assumption for the course project, but for many practical reactors, a diabetic assumption is true. So let's note here then that if heat is exchanged, well then we're back to our heat transfer course and we know that we need a few extra terms then. We'll need to know U and Cp. So my heat transfer coefficient and Cp my heat capacities. These are going to be required. Okay, so all the, all, the, all the terms that we, we know from heat transfer are going to start to kick in. So if we're assuming there is no heat exchange, that makes our life easier. But when heat is exchanged, we're going to need a few extra pieces of information. That heat transfer coefficients, heat capacities, then then tell us what is the capacity for that liquid or gas to actually take up heat and how much can it take up. So clearly we need those terms when we're not operating adiabatically. Okay, so now we're down to a simpler case. Now we have that zero is equal to Q dot minus Schaffer plus the sum of Fi zero, Hi zero minus the sum of Fi Hi. Okay, so the summations are always over every species, one to n, so I will drop that and Fogler does that as well after a while. He stops writing summation, subscript, and superscript. Because we know we have to count for every species. Let's take a look now a little bit more at these terms over here. What do those enthalpy terms mean? Let's, let's go back and recap some basic uh, basics from chemistry here. This is important to, to understand because we're going to have to ultimately look up this information in our textbooks and give us information on enthalpies and heats of formation and heats of reaction. If you read the course project, you're not given any of that information. So we're going to have to know where to look this information up. So let's go recap 
what these H's mean and how we should interpret them and actually use them. So HI0, that's the enthalpy of the i stream at the entry point. We could write that as HI at T0 would be another way of saying it. So this is enthalpy at inlet temperature. And HI is the enthalpy of that same species leaving the reactor. In fact, it's not only leaving the reactor, it's at any point from the inlet onwards. So the moment our species start to react and heat starts to be generated or consumed, the temperature is going to change. So this T is generic. It's not only at the exit. We will, in fact, get profiled of temperature in the same way we've been getting profiled of concentration, profiled of conversion. We'll also get a profile of temperature. So let's understand a bit how that, those work again. A regular example of A, B, C, and D. So I've got A, A plus B, B going to C, C plus D, D plus inert. So there may be some inert gases in the system. We could write then that. The summation of Fi Hi in this particular case expands out to Fa Ha plus Fb Hb plus Fc Hc plus Fd Hd plus the flow rate of my inerts times the entropy of those inerts. So it expands out to five terms four species plus the inverse. And you get a similar expansion for the entry. Okay. So now let's recap four or five things from a few classes ago. The sub in the following. We had derived in an earlier class that the flow rate of the ith species, so Fi, is equal to Fi0 <coughs> times theta i plus nu i x, the conversion. Oh my goodness, what do those terms mean? Let's take them. Go back a few more classes. Well, Fi0 is the flow rate at the inlet, that's clear. Theta i, we call is equal to Fi0 divided by Fa0. Nu i, or this funny Greek v, is equal to, for example, it's equal to C over A. We were considering species C, or it's going to be equal to something like minus B over A species B. Okay, and also notice then, or, or, or let's not notice, but recap importantly that that Xi refers to the conversion of A. So for single reactions, it's okay to work with conversion. But ultimately, the, like in a course project or in general, we're dealing with multiple reactions. So make a mental note here, this is a, even this, while it's fairly complicated, is only for one reaction. We're going to come back in a few classes from now and step this up to multiple reactions. Okay, so we're going to take away that uh, we're going to take away the conversion. So 
if we make those substitutions as I wrote up there, one nice thing we can write, or one nice thing we'll discover after doing quite a bit of algebraic manipulation, we'll find that we get the heat of reaction jumping out as one of the terms. So the so the quick recap here then is the heat of reaction, delta HR, at a given temperature. So heat of reaction again is one of those things that's not constant. It is very much a function of temperature. You can see how it, why we've made this isothermal assumption up to now. It's made our life so much easier. Now, the moment we take the isothermal assumption away, everything starts to suddenly vary with temperature. Our rate constants vary, our equilibrium constants vary, heats of reaction are not constant. They also vary as a function of temperature. And that function is given as in this example, d of d over a multiplied by, by Hg, and that's a function of temperature as well. So those enthalpies are not constant. Enthalpies are also a function of temperature. Plus C over A times HD is a function of temperature. Minus B of A times HD minus A over A, which is minus 1, of the enthalpy of A at a certain temperature. And just a quick a quick note here on the units, this is very important and where people trip up, is that the units are equal to joules per mole of A reacting. So you were used to just writing joules per mole for heat of reaction, but it's joules per mole of what? We've got multiple species here, so we need to be clear. It's joules per mole of A. Whatever we've chosen as our basis, A is the, is the heat of reaction is defined for that mole of that species reaction. Okay, so now if we come back to this expression over here, we can simplify it a little bit more. We can in fact write zero is equal to Q naught, the heat, coming in and out of the system if there's heat exchange. The sharp work, and now we substitute in these other terms over here, and we get minus FA naught, the flow rate of A, my base is coming in. And this time we sum over theta I multiplied by HI minus H I zero, so enthalpy in minus enthalpy out for the I species. Minus heat of reaction at a given temperature times F A zero times X. Mm -hmm. It's outside the summation. Okay, so actually this substitution of these three expressions in here, and the simplification to this is quite an amount of work. So this is FA0 outside here, there's an FA0 outside as well. That's why I don't want to go every single step in the folder's derivation. There's a lot of algebraic manipulation that goes in behind this. I find it more useful just to pick out the major key points Long uh, would that really change those phrases? If B was your reference, you just rewrite your equation so that it's in terms of A. So whatever the case you can This is why we work with this generic A. Okay, so now what we have is just a, we need to have a little bit of a discussion, in fact, on these enthalpy terms. We know that they're a function of temperature. Well, where are we going to look up this information? Let's recall from the second year course then that the HI, the enthalpy at a, at a certain temperature, can in fact be written as 
HI at a reference temperature, T ref. And then we integrate the heat capacity of the species as a function of temperature dt. And our limits of integration are from the reference temperature to the temperature we're interested in. Okay, so if I need HI at some elevated temperature, I go to my base case, which is usually 25 degrees. And we give this term here a special name, HI superscript zero at a reference temperature which usually corresponds to 25 degrees. We call that the enthalpy of formation. So enthalpy at some other temperature is my enthalpy of formation plus an additional delta. Well, how much is that delta? It's this term over here which is the integral of the heat capacity as a function of temperature. So yet another thing that's varying as a function of temperature. So you can start to see how this is quickly, or even very simple systems going to land up in the order of 40, 50 equations. Okay, so polymath is definitely out of the question if you're using the educational version. Okay, polymath has a limit of 40 equations for the educational version. You're forced to open them to MATLAB, unless you buy a full license. Now, the <laughs> Let's just take a look then at this term. Okay, so there's, there's some important uh, uh, concepts here on this term that we need to quickly cover. And then we'll leave it at that for today. <coughs> In, in textbooks like Felder and Rousseau, or Perry's, or the Handbook of Liquids and Gases, or in fact, many of the references given in the course project on page three, I give you some references where you can go look this information out. You'll find then that CPI is given to you in something that looks along the lines of A plus BT plus CT squared plus DT cubed. Okay, so it's very simple then to go substitute that function of CPN to the integral. Uh, so the question is then to what power should we go to? Well, what you'll find is for most systems that even going to B to the T is not going to change things too much. Okay, so what we'll find for most systems It is quite okay to use that CP for the ice species as a function of temperature is equal to A. Okay. So just go to a single, single value. You'll find that even if you add the VT term, that it hardly changes the heat capacity. In other words, in English, what that's saying, heat capacity is constant. Okay. Or approximately constant, I should say, to be more, more accurate. Okay, so then the final step then on this derivation, and we'll leave it there and then we'll take it up tomorrow. <laughs> Constant capacity. 
But I must stress it is important to verify that it is in fact a fair approximation to make. So it's very easy to do that, but verify that over the range of temperatures you're considering in your project, that, that approximation is valid. <coughs> Ti0 is the temperature of I at the inlet. The temperature of species I at the inlet. And in most cases, we feed all our species at the same temperature, so that's just T0. So, right now, you actually have, we've shown here, some of the additional information you'll start to need for your course projects are these heat capacities and these heat sublimations. So that's something you can go look up quite simply for the five species that you're dealing with in the project. Then you're going to already be a long way ahead when we go come to class tomorrow and we start to see how to actually yeah.